that, uh, that it might have been Francis Bacon who said this, that a bunch of monks that got together and they debated how many teeth a, a horse had. And then a young monk came along and said, why don't you just look in the mouth, mouth of a horse and count how many teeth they have instead of relying on what Aristotle taught us? And the important monks uh, felt that this was really a bad thing to say. And he, they turned to the young monk and said, what do you know? You know nothing. Aristotle was the greatest mind. And they punished him. Well, in fact, it, as it turns out, horses really don't have 40 teeth. I think they have more than 40 teeth. But it wasn't until somebody thought to actually look in a horse's mouth that people realized that what Aristotle had said and what many generations had accepted as being the truth was actually wrong. So I was taught a number of things. Um, I was taught that adjacent level problems in the cerebral spine are due to problems that when we did a fusion, that it caused the adjacent level problems. I was also taught that, you know, somebody I think is, uh, has their mic on, if you could mute your mic, because we can hear somebody uh, in the background. Okay, I think that's better. We were also taught that uh, neck pain is not surgically treatable. And, uh, and we were also taught that cervical dermatomes and myotomes are very reliable and you can rely on them to pick the surgical levels. So let's talk about adjacent level uh, problems, adjacent segment pathology. This was a case that I did in 1996. And by the time, nine years later, we got another x-ray, you can see that the level above has broken down and the level below has broken down. Now, is that iatrogenic? Did I cause that by doing the surgery or was that natural history? Well, there's increasing evidence that this is due to the natural history and very little of it is actually due to what we do as surgeons. There's data looking at anterior cervical fusion versus foraminotomy, arthroplasty versus ACDF. There's kinematics data, fusion data, et cetera. So this is, an, uh, uh, this is a paper that Henderson uh, published in neurosurgery back in 1983. He looked at 846 foraminotomy patients and found that there was about a 1.9% average annual incidence of radiculopathy that developed in these patients and that the surgical rate for adjacent segment pathology was about 3%. So in foraminotomy patients, he found that about 3% of the patients needed surgery every year. And that's roughly comparable to the percentage of uh, patients who need surgery after doing a fusion. This is the Herkowitz paper in spine in 1990, and it was a prospective comparison of ACDF versus foraminotomy for a herniated disc. And they found that adjacent level radiographic changes occurred after ACDF in 41% of the cases versus with a foraminotomy 50% of the cases. So again, when you look at x-rays, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between the patients that you fused versus the patients you did a foraminotomy on, suggesting that again, it's all due to a natural history as opposed to the fusion operation. And then we look at all the arthroplasty data that's uh, come out and uh, does a total disc replacement lower the risk of radiographic adjacent, so just x-ray changes, or does it change the clinical adjacent segment pathology uh, when you compare it to fusions? And there's a whole lot of data on this now, and there are a lot, a lot of prospective studies that have been done and when you look at the clinical adjacent segment pathologies after a total disc replacement versus an ACDF, the reoperation rates for both is between about one and 5% per year. There is not that much of a difference. This is the seven year follow up, and they did notice in this uh, study of uh, the ProDisc C that there was about an 11% difference at seven years. This is the Prestige LP, and again, initially they didn't find much of a difference. But later on, they found about a 7% difference in the adjacent segment uh, reoperation rate. This was a study, long-term prestige at two levels. And again, there was about a 10% difference in the reoperation rates. But when you look at all of the cervical arthroplasties, some have found that there are differences, and some have found that there are no differences 
in adjacent segment uh, pathology rate. And a meta-analysis, three said, yeah, there is a difference, and one said there wasn't. And even when you look at these differences, they're not huge, three versus 5%. 3% versus 8%, 5 versus 7, 4 versus 7. So there is a difference, but not that great of a difference. Um, and this is a paper that I uh, was a, one of the co-authors on that was just published in neurosurgery in 2019. And what we found was that, yes, there does appear to be a difference. With the Brian, the reoperation at the adjacent level was about 10%. With the ACDF, it was about 16%. So there's about a 6% difference at 10 years. Now, there wasn't a statistically significant difference. If you notice, the p-value is 0.1. So we combined it with the seven-year data from the prestige, and only then could we find that there was a 7 versus 12% difference. That's only a 5% difference in the adjacent level reoperation rates at between 7 to 10 years. So even in that long period of time, there's only a small amount of difference. And then you have to look at what the problems with these prospective randomized control studies are. So in the United States, these patients were recruited and they were told, you'll either get the artificial disc or you'll get the fusion. You won't get to decide, the surgeon doesn't get to decide, a computer will decide for you what you get. So when a patient got the artificial disc, they felt like, yes, I won the lottery. I'm so happy I got the artificial disc. And the patients who got the fusion said, oh, I got the fusion. And some people actually said, I'm not having surgery, forget it. I wanted the artificial disc, and if I can't get it, I'm going to go somewhere else and just get the artificial disc. And uh, so when the next level broke down, the patients who had the ACDF realized, you know what, I had the fusion, and it was a great operation. I felt great. My neck range of motion is excellent. I really didn't lose any motion. So when they needed surgery at the next level, they said, sure, I'll get the ACDF. I don't have any problems with that. But when the patients who got the artificial disc were told, oh, you need surgery at the next level, and in the United States, the artificial disc isn't approved yet, we have to do a fusion. They said, fusion? No, I enrolled in this study because I didn't want the fusion. I got the artificial disc. I love it. I don't want a fusion. I'm not having surgery. So that accounted for some of the difference between the group that got the artificial disc and the ones that got the fusion. So when you look at that difference of about 6%, you have to understand that that difference also represents the fact that people who got the artificial disc did not want any more surgeries. And that may be why there's some of that difference. We did this study a number of years ago on survivorship analysis, and we found that laminoplasty has the lowest rate of needing surgery for aminotomy. And then uh, if you look at uh, anterior operations, whether you're doing the artificial disc or the fusion, there wasn't a statistically significant difference. So it appears that there it probably is a little bit of a difference. But if there should be a difference because of the fusion, you would notice a huge difference in this group of patients. So these were clipophile patients that we looked at. These were patients who were born with a fusion. And so you would think that if they were born with a fusion, that they would need surgery at the adjacent level at a much earlier date than patients who did not have a fusion. So when we looked at the clipophile patients, there were 42 and 22 with clipophile syndrome and 44 controls. And we looked at how old are they when they have their first operation. If the clipophile fusion causes adjacent level problems early, then you would think that the clipophile patients would have their first operation at the next level when they're in their 20s. In fact, what we found is whether you have clipophile syndrome or you have a normal cervical spine, the average age at needing surgery was about 50.5 years. There was no difference between congenitally autofused patients and patients who had a normal cervical spine, suggesting again that a fusion does not add a lot of pressure at the next level, causing it to break down faster, causing you to need surgery any more than uh, anyone else. And then we looked at uh, this study of uh, radiculopathy versus uh, uh, myelo and myelopathy at the next level. Um, this was a study that is most often quoted. It's Alan Hillebrand's study on adjacent level disease. And what he said was that the lowest risk of needing surgery again is in somebody who's had a fusion at C4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7. So if 
adjacent level problems are due to doing fusions, then the more levels you fuse, the more stress uh, you put on the adjacent levels, and you would think that they would break down faster. So a three-level fusion should have a greater risk of needing surgery at the next level than a one-level fusion. In fact, that wasn't the case. A three-level fusion at four, five, five, six, six, seven had the lowest rate of needing surgery again. The C7, T1, and C3, 4 rarely break down and require surgery. And what it says is that these are the three levels that most commonly break down and require surgery. So if you take care of those three, odds are you may never need to do surgery on that patient again. And we um, uh, looked at also uh, this study that was uh, part of an adjacent segment pathology uh, special issue, uh, a focus issue in the spine journal. And what we found is that the risk factors for the clinical adjacent segment pathology, the breakdown at the next level, was if you were young. If you had a fusion adjacent to C5, 6, or C6, 7. So if you had a C4, 5, or a C7, T1 fusion, you're much more likely to need surgery because 5, 6, 6, 7 are the most common levels to break down and require surgery. So if you had a, a herniated disc at another level and you didn't take care of it, you're very likely to have uh, uh, the need for surgery. And if you had compression with a canal that was less than 13 millimeters, you're more likely to need surgery. If you think about it, if you take your car in and you have a flat tire because your tire is bald and you change that tire and two months later, you need the left front tire changed, you wouldn't say it was because I changed my right front tire that you now need to change the left. You say all the tires are exactly the same age. So if the right one is worn out, the left one is gonna be worn out. If the C5-6 is worn out, the C6-7 is gonna be worn out. All your cervical discs are exactly the same age. They've undergone the same amount of mileage. And it's just that some break down faster than others. And in the orthopedic world, if you had a hip replacement and your knee broke down, you wouldn't say my knee broke down because I got a new hip replacement. It's because your cartilage is made up of the same material. And this, the hip, is the same age as the knee. And here, this is a patient who's never had cervical spine surgery, but they've got breakdown at four, five, five, six, six, seven. They have anterolisthesis of C7 on T1 and three on four, and it has nothing to do with prior surgery. This person has a virgin spine, but it's because they obviously have broken down all of the levels because they are the same age. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't make it worse. If you do a bad job, if you view somebody in kyphosis or you end up uh, using a plate that's too long, you can make the next level break down a little bit faster and that can increase the risk of needing surgery at the next level. Now, the second thing that I was taught was that you should never operate for neck pain because neck pain is not surgically treatable. And I would say definitely that is the case for a lot of different kinds of neck pain. I've taught this myself for 20 years and said you should never operate for neck pain. But the neck pain that I'm talking about that you shouldn't operate for are people who have pain right in the middle of their neck or at the base of their neck and that's all. They don't have radiating pain. They don't have any other areas that hurt because it's hard to localize pain that's dead center right in the middle. But neck pain is very, very common. And most people don't have that kind of neck pain. It's very rare to see somebody with pain just right in the middle of their neck. They say about 30% of uh, young people in their 20s end up having neck pain. And by the time you're in your 40s, at least half the people suffer from neck pain. And neck pain is very important to patients. This was a study that we did years ago. And we compared neck pain um, that is associated with radiculopathy and myelopathy treated either with an artificial disc replacement or with a fusion. So this is the preoperative neck pain. The neck pain is in yellow and arm pain is in blue. You can see that the neck pain scores are actually worse than the arm pain scores. And after the surgery, both the neck pain and the arm pain go away very nicely. And that's with the artificial disc. With a fusion, the same thing. You have higher scores for neck pain than for arm pain. And after the surgery, both neck pain and arm pain scores drop precipitously. So what we concluded is that if you have neck pain, along with radiculopathy or myelopathy, that you can reassure the patient that both the neck pain and the arm pain is all gonna go away. 
any surgeon who has done a lot of cervical spine surgery knows that a lot of patients complain about neck pain before the surgery and it goes away. But we are much more wary about operating on patients who have no arm symptoms and only have neck pain. But I would tell you there are some kinds of neck pain that are amenable to treatment with surgery. You can treat this. For instance, C12 osteoarthritis. These patients have severe arthritis of the C12 joint, as you can see on the CAT scan and as you can see on the Oakland Mapodontoid view. Their joint is completely obliterated and they will complain about pain just behind the mastoid process and it gets worse on rotation. So if it's on the left side, they will say, I can only turn about this much. And then their eye starts to, uh, to squint and they have, ooh, it really hurts. And then when you ask them to look to the right, they say, well, I can get to about here, but once I get to here, it starts to hurt here again, so I don't wanna turn. It won't hurt as much looking up or down as it does looking left and right. And the amazing thing is most of these patients have severe arthritis of all the levels in the cervical spine. As you can see on the CT scan, this patient is auto-fused at 2.3 and 3.4. And their 4.5 level has severe facet arthritis on the CT scan. But for some reason, they never have pain there. I've operated on maybe 40 patients with C12 osteoarthritis. All of them had terrible arthritis at all of the levels in the cervical spine. I've only had to operate on one of those patients for a subaxial below C2 problem. All the other patients, no matter how terrible their arthritis was below the C12, had no pain whatsoever. I can't tell you why that's the case, but I can tell you that these patients just do not have pain, despite the fact that they have terrible, terrible arthritis. Now, the C12 joint is a diarthrodeal joint. It's like a hip joint. It has cartilage on both sides, and it's a very, uh, it has no disc, obviously, and that's why it doesn't break down often. But all the diseases that break down hip joints and knee joints and finger joints, like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, like lupus, uh, like uh, uh, calcium py pyrophosphate, pseudo gout and gout, can cause arthritis of this joint and cause se severe problems. And if you operate at that level and you fuse the C12 joint, it is amazing. It will take away the pain. Now, it also takes away left and right rotational motion. So I tell patients, if the pain is bad enough that you say, I don't care if I can't look left and right, uh, and I want that pain to go away, we can fuse that joint. You won't be able to look left and right, but the pain will go away. And eventually, 95% of the patients opt to have that uh, level fused. And the resulting surgery is about 98% of the patients are extremely happy with the results of the surgery. Other types of neck pain that are amenable to surgical treatment is not really neck pain. I was sitting with my mentor, Henry Bowman, at the Cervical Spine Research Society when a, a neurosurgeon who was the presidential guest uh, lecturer said, this is a kind of neck pain that you can cure with a foraminotomy. So patients who have pain that go up behind the ear and into the temple or behind the ear and into the eye, that is a high cervical radiculopathy. That's a pinched nerve. That's a pinched nerve, either the C3 or the C4 nerve root. And we did this study and published it a number of years ago, where we took 35 patients and uh, 23 had um, you know, greater than one year follow-up. And they had pain that was behind the ear, headaches back here and into the temple. And we found that all of these patients did very nicely. And they all had foraminal stenosis. It would get worse with spurlings. We did a nerve root block to see if the pain would go away and found that this resulted in excellent relief of the symptoms. This patient was told that they had fibromyalgia and uh, she had pain in the suboccipital region, retroauricular pain going this way and in the trapezii. And, uh, and people told her that uh, there's nothing you can do about it. We just did an ACDF at that one level and it took her uh, pain away completely. That is a very typical pain uh, that you get with a C4 radiculopathy. You can also treat neck pain when it is associated with a pseudoarthrosis. So you can see in this patient, the graft is fractured 
they put in the screws that are way too short, the graft is too small, and the patient went on to a non-union. And uh, so when you fix the pseudoarthrosis, often these patients have been suffering for years and they've had terrible pain. You fix it, the pain is gone almost instantaneously. And these patients are very, very happy. So that's yet another type of neck pain that will go away uh, with an operation. And then patients also say neck when they have interscapular pain, they have pain radiating over the shoulders and into the trapezii. And when I first started out, I said, I can't really tell which level is causing the pain in these uh, areas. And so I rarely did surgeries for this kind of pain. And then when patients would come in and they said, I have pain over here, I started listening to them and said, okay, show me exactly where the pain is. And then often they would have that pain along with the arm pain. And if that pain would go away with a one level ACDF, I would say, okay, now I know what causes that pain. And every time I saw a patient with, let's say a C6, seven herniated disc, and I did an ACDF and it made that pain go away, I would say, okay, this is the area where that neck pain is, even though it's not neck, it's uh, down here. So if you look on the, um, uh, on the slide, patients who complain about pain in this red area right there, this is the spine of the scapula. And if they're complaining about pain right there, that level in about 95% of the time, that is the C6-7 level. A C7 radiculopathy will cause pain right medial to the spine of the scapula. If it is the C5-6, it'll be here and over the supraspinatus fossa up here. And the C4-5 level will be over the trapezius and coming down into the deltoid. But patients say, this is neck pain, that's neck pain, and that's neck pain. The C7, T1 level will be down here and T1, T2 will be towards the tip of the scapula. And this is as accurate a way to diagnose the level as the dermatomes and the myotomes. I have found that if the patient has a C6, 7 radiculopathy, they will complain about pain here. They also will complain about pain in the anterior chest and in the axilla. That's another very common place for patients with C6, 7 and C7T1 down a little bit lower and down a little bit lower in the axilla, they will complain about pain when it's the C7T1. But this is a very common level for the C6-7 level patients to complain of. And the next time you see somebody with a C6-7, if you go to them and say, does it hurt right here? You'll find that if it hurts there, not everybody hurts there, only about maybe 50 or 60% of the patients who have a C6-7 herniated disc or radiculopathy will have pain. But if the pain is there, over 90% of the time, it'll be coming from the C6-7 level. Now, there are many different things that can cause pains here and here. You can have a subdiaphragmatic abscess. You can have problems with your shoulders. You can have the problems with the scapula. You can have uh, a tumor, a pancose tumor can uh, cause uh, pain in that area. So just because it hurts there doesn't mean that all of the pains there are due to the cervical spine. But the cervical spine does cause a lot of pains in those areas and patients call that neck pain. They don't say shoulder pain or pain in between my shoulder blades. So when somebody says I have neck pain, you have to listen to them and ask them, what do you mean by the neck pain? Where exactly is it hurting? The third thing that I was taught is that cervical dermatomes and myotomes are very reliable. So the reason that we operate for radiculopathy coming down the arm is that we say it's very reliable and you can, based on what muscles are weak, what fingers are numb, we can diagnose the level of the problem. And so if you can diagnose it, you can operate and you can get excellent results. But this was a paper that was published uh, by uh, the group at um, Emory University uh, recently, and John Ree, who's the second author, was one of my former fellows. And what they uh, published was that only 54% of their patients with a one-level radiculopathy actually followed the typical patterns of radiculopathy. So the vast majority of patients do not follow the Netter diagrams or the diagrams that we all learned of what the patterns are. So we all learned that, oh yeah, if this is uh, this area is C6, this is C7, this is C8. And if you've got uh, pain or numbness in this area, this is what the dermatomes should be. But if you go back 
and you actually study to see how did we get that information? We go all the way back to Forster publishing in Brain in 1933. And he did rhizotomies for patients who had cerebral palsy with spasticity or intractable pain. And most of the Netter diagrams are based on Forster's diagram. You can see this is the Forster diagram and it looks a lot like the Netter diagrams. Now let's see exactly how Forster did it. Well, what he found was that if you just cut one nerve, let's say you cut the C6 nerve root, often he would get absolutely no deficit. The patients would wake up, there would be no weakness and no numbness. He realized that there was so much overlap of the dermatomes and even myotomes that just cutting one nerve would not do any, would not uh, cause anything to be changed and the patient would still have symptoms. So he, what he would do is he would cut two nerves. So if he wanted to find out what the C6 nerve root did, he would cut C5 and he would cut C7. And then he would see what was left. And that's how he would determine what the C6 nerve root did. Now, you would think that he did this on a lot of people in order to figure it out. No, it was two to five patients per level. So it's like saying that I'm gonna look at two to five people on this webinar. And I'm gonna look at, let's say Mark Aurelio, and I'm gonna look at me and I'm gonna say, all human beings look like Mark Aurelio me. Well, we all know that people don't look like me and that every human being is unique. And yet we think that if we look at two to five cadavers and we just dissect out two to five cadavers, that that's how every human being is supposed to be? Well, that's ridiculous. Of course, it's gonna be inaccurate if you do it that way. There are a lot of overlap of dermatomes. So even cutting two nerves, sometimes you won't see much of a deficit. And if you cut a nerve, the interesting thing is the brachial plexus reroutes the dermatomes and myotomes. The interesting is why doesn't it do it when you have a herniated disc? So if you herniate a disc, the patient will have severe pain and numbness and weakness. If you cut the nerve, a lot of the times there is no weakness, no numbness and no pain. It's because the body reroutes around a, uh, a completely severed nerve where it may not be able to do that if the nerve is just impinged or if it is um, only uh, partially damaged. The other thing is that you have to take into account how much time it took between cutting the nerve and mapping it. Because if you cut the nerve and you map it months later or weeks later, the body will already have uh, started to reroute and you may get a totally different picture. The next person that we rely on for uh, the Netter diagrams is another, you can see the Netter diagrams uh, again in his. This is Keegan, Keegan and Garrett in 1948, they took, a lot more patients now. They took 1,300 patients. They took patients with a one level herniated disc based on the myelography. And what they did was they said, okay, if you have a single level herniated disc at C67 and you say, this is what type of radiculopathy the patient had, they mapped it out. The problem was this, myelograms often miss pathology. So if you have a far lateral disc herniation, you can't see it on a myelogram. You need a CT scan and even a CT will miss the far lateral because the dura adheres to the nerve and there is no filling of the dye when you're out, way out laterally. And a, so a far lateral disc herniation of the cervical spine, you can't see on a myelogram, you can't see on a CT. You can only see on the parasagittal MRI images. Now, out of that 1300, he only had 165 that were between C5 and T1. Only 47 had a one level problem at surgery and all the surgery were done posteriorly from laminectomies. So if you do a laminectomy, you're not gonna explore anteriorly in front of the disc. So if there's a disc in the front and unless you do a, uh, an intradural uh, operation where you cut the dentate ligament and you cut the ventral dura and you explore in the front to see if there's a herniated disc, you're never gonna find it with a laminectomy. So if there was a herniated disc at another level, he would have missed it. So obviously this is not going to be a very accurate way to determine a single level herniated disc problem. 
There are a lot of anomalous distributions. This was a patient that I treated years ago. He had a C67 disc herniation. He had deltoid, biceps weakness, and numbness of the thumb and index finger. And I said, that can't be the C67 level because the C67 would give you triceps and your fingers, either these two, this one, or these two, or these three fingers would be numb. And I said, I don't think uh, surgery is going to help you. But he was in so much pain and he had so much uh, uh, problems with his weakness and uh, with his numbness that I sent him for a transferaminal nerve block. And when I did it at C67, pain was instantly gone. I tried it at C45, nothing. Tried it at 5.6, nothing. 6.7, pain was gone immediately. So I said, this isn't going to help your weakness. It's not going to help with the numbness because those are coming from different levels. It has nothing to do with your herniated disc at C6-7, but it's obvious that your pain is coming from the C6-7 level. We took out the disc, the pain went away, the numbness went away, and the weakness went away. All instantly, right after the surgery. And I said, this is impossible. How, how is this? Because I looked in every textbook and no textbook said, that a C67 herniated disc could possibly cause numbness in these fingers or weakness of the deltoid and biceps. I said, that's just not possible. I just said, well, it must be a coincidence and forgot about it. Years later, we looked at aberrant cervical dermatomes and myotomes on patients that I had treated with a one level disc herniation and patients that got better immediately after the surgery. And we found that 61% had abnormal myotomes and dermatomes that didn't fit the Netter diagrams. 12 had abnormal myotomes, 22 had abnormal dermatomes, and three had both abnormal dermatomes and myotomes. And it turns out that this is pretty common. The brachial plexus has tremendous variability. It's bilaterally asymmetric. The brachial plexus on the right looks different from the left in 40% of patients. And many have a C4 contribution to the deltoid. So they have a prefixed brachial plexus where the C4 contributes to the deltoid. And some have a postfixed brachial plexus where the T2 nerve root contributes to the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is supposed to be C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. But in some people, it's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And in other people, it's 5, 6, 7, uh, 6, 7, 8. T1, T2. And so it is highly, highly variable. These are just some of the 29 different kinds of uh, brachial plexus uh, uh, anomalies that people have discovered. There are at least 29 that have been described in the literature. And this was about four or five years ago that I looked it up. I'm sure by now there must be 30, 40, 50 different uh, types of brachial plexus anatomies that have been found in humans. And then once they have come out, the variations in how the brachial plexus move is, is even greater. So if you look at how they come out and how they vary afterwards, there are thousands of different kinds of brachial plexus anatomies. And probably no two people have the exact same brachial plexus anatomy that's the same on the left as on the right which tells you that we were all taught to memorize a brachial plexus, draw it out, and we were all told to memorize it. But that's really a waste of time because if a professor right now would ask me, draw out the brachial plexus, I would tell the professor, okay, there are about 5,000 different variations of the brachial plexus anatomy that have been found. Which one of those 5,000 would you like me to draw for you? And of course, the professor would say, you're a smart aleck, draw the one that's in the textbooks. And I say, but the textbook is wrong. The textbook assumes that there's one. It's like saying, draw me the picture of a human being. And I draw me. And I say, all human beings look like this. And we all know all human beings, thank God, don't look like this. So then after the brachial plexus comes out, there are all kinds of peripheral anatomical differences. A Martin Gruber anastomosis, where the median nerve goes into the ulnar nerve, is there of almost half of the cases. And in these cases, you could cut the ulnar nerve and the patient has no deficits. That's how amazing anatomy is. A Marinacci communication, 
ulnar nerve to the median nerve. So if you cut the median nerve in these patients, they have no deficits because the ulnar nerve also does the function of the median nerve. And there are a whole bunch of these things that have been described. So the problem is that there's so many different anatomical variations that you need to have a framework of how many people are. But that doesn't mean that you can say every human being is like that. You have to understand that there are variations. Situs inversus, all the organs that are on the left and the average person are on the right. In one in 100,000 people, the heart is on the right. The liver is on the left. The stomach is on the right. Everything has been inverted with a situs inversus. So if you say the heart is always on the left, you would be wrong. In one in 100,000 people, you would be wrong. And if it's one in 100,000 people, there are gonna be several dozen people in the United States, several thousand people in the United States, uh, 100 people in the United States that have anomalous hearts that are on the right and instead of on the left. So cervical dermatomes and myotomes are not as simple as we've been taught to believe that are in the textbooks. They are highly variable. And so that is yet another lie that they taught us. They weren't meaning to lie, it's just that just, just didn't know. So the more you know about cervical anatomy, the more confusing it all gets. Because then when you say you've got numbness here, how do you know it's supposed to be C6 as opposed to C7? Could it be C5 in a prefixed brachial plexus? Could it be both five and six? Could it be five, six, and seven? Well, the problem is that you cannot be positive anymore because now you know how anomalous the variations can be and how anatomy can be highly varied. That's why what you have to do is you have to pay attention. You have to learn from your patients. And they say that I practice medicine because I'm practicing, I'm learning constantly. So when a patient comes in and I see that they have a one level disc herniation, I always ask them, where does it hurt? Where in the neck does it hurt? Where in between the shoulder blades does it hurt? Where in the arm does it hurt? Which fingers are numb? What part of the arm is numb? And I see the variations. C7, sometimes they say, oh, I'm numb here. Sometimes I'm numb here. Sometimes I'm numb in these two, in these three, in these four. The whole hand is numb in some people. Sometimes it's these two fingers. Sometimes it's these three. Sometimes it's these four fingers. Sometimes it's just one finger or the thumb. And I see the amount of variation there is with just a single nerve root problem. And I learn from that and I understand that when somebody comes in with a single level pathology and they say the whole hand is numb, I used to think, oh, they're faking it or they're crazy or they must have something else going on. Now I know that, yes, I still look to make sure they don't have a cubital tunnel syndrome or a Guillain's canal compression. I make sure that they don't have something else going on. But now I'm much more comfortable saying, I think it's all coming from the C6-7 herniated disc. And I think that there's a very good chance that all of it will go away when we operate at that one level. So remember that we do stand on the shoulder of giants who came before us, who taught us but you have to question everything. You can't just accept what they tell you. If you take a look here, there is a sponge at the bottom of the scrub sink. And I was one time washing my hands in a scrub sink and one of the people who cleaned the room came out and said, why do surgeons always throw their sponges in that sink when there's a garbage can right here? You should just throw it in the garbage can and instead of in the sink. But all the surgeons always just throw it in the sink. Are the surgeons that lazy? Because then he has to go in and he has to grab that and he has to throw it in the garbage. The reason we do that is that 20 years ago, we didn't have disposable sponges. We reused them. So we would come up to the sink, we would hit it with our elbow, we would take the sponge, we would wash our hands and we would put it in the sink. And then at the end of the day, they would take all of those sponges, they would take it back, they would wash it, they would sterilize it, and they would put it back in the wall so that the next day you could use the sponge again. The professors, and I, including, including me, who were taught to do that way, got used to throwing the sponge in the sink. So we would just throw it in the sink without even thinking about it. The new young surgeons would come along and see us doing that and say, oh, we should throw the sponges in the sink. I don't know why we throw it in the sink. We just throw it in the sink because that's what my professor taught me. 
And so that has propagated generation after generation, despite the fact that it makes no sense. So we should all stop this kind of doing things reflexively just because our professor taught it to us. We have to think for ourselves. We have to learn for ourselves. Everything that our professors taught us, we have to respect, but we have to question. We have to assume that half of what they taught us is incorrect. Half of what they taught us is a lie. And I will leave you with one last thought about surgeons and how we can learn from everybody. Ignaz Semmelweis was a general surgeon who did OBGYN and so on in Vienna General Hospital back in the 1800s. And he noticed something very interesting. He noticed that if you take a look at this graph, this is the infant mortality rate when doctors delivered the babies. It was very, very high, up to 15, 16% infant mortality in 1842. This was when midwives delivered. These were not doctors, they were midwives. And he said, why is it that the doctors kill more babies than midwives? You would think that a well-trained doctor would have a much higher success rate and a lower infection rate, when in fact, they had an infection rate that was much, much higher. It was three times higher when a doctor delivered the baby than when a midwife delivered the baby. And then, so he said, I need to find out why this is the case. So he would follow the doctors as they deliver the babies, and he would follow the midwives to see what they did differently. And he found this, that before the doctors delivered the baby, these doctors would sit around, they had nothing to do until the baby was delivered, so they said, I'm gonna make good use of my time. I'm going to go to the morgue, and I'm going to take cadavers, and I'm going to dissect to learn the anatomy. So they would go in there, and they would take cadavers, and they would dissect. And then when somebody would call them and say, doctor, the baby's about to come, the doctor would rush to the delivery room and they would deliver the baby, but they didn't wash their hands. So they went from dissecting on a dead person to delivering a live baby. And of course, some of those dead people had bacteria in them. So they coated their hands with bacteria, they delivered the baby, the babies got an infection and the babies died. The midwives obviously did not dissect on cadavers, they waited on the patient, and when the woman was ready to deliver, they delivered the baby, their hands were clean, and so their infant mortality rate was much lower. So he said, what you must do is you must wash your hands before you deliver the babies because there's something on your skin that is causing these babies to die. So just that simple observation allowed him to save babies' lives. And Thanks to him, we now understand that you must wash your hands before you do any surgical procedures, before you deliver any babies. And what it teaches us is that rather than just doing exactly what our professors did and taught us for our benefit, it wasn't because they were trying to you know, teach us the wrong things. And it's not because we are bad that we teach the next generation of students and residents and fellows the wrong information. It's because we don't know any better. That's why we have to make sure that they also learn that we are totally fallible. We make mistakes and they have to check up on us to make sure that what we taught them is in fact good and correct information. Otherwise, they will continue to throw that sponge into the sink instead of into the garbage can where it belongs. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I would say, go back to Einstein. The important thing is not to stop questioning. We all <clears throat> must question everything that we've been taught. Thank you so much. Antes de começar a sessão de perguntas, estou vendo aqui na tela o doutor Pimenta. Quer ajudar o doutor Pimenta? Sim, yeah. uh, Dan, congratulations, great talk. Uh, it is so interesting that I just heard from you what 
I have experienced my life. Um, we, we learn at school that nerve X gives this and nerve Y another dermatome. And in my experience, this is, I, I, you know, I respect my resident that tell me, oh, this is not the dermatome that should be. I say, yes, but I believe that the pain comes from here, not from the book. So uh, <laughs> it's so, so different, so different. And uh, I, it's great to hear this because I thought I was myself the crazy guy that doesn't believe in what the book says. Uh, Excellent talk. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thanks, Pimenta. I, I appreciate it. Uh, and it's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Like the mustache. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, this is the COVID-19 look. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so it, it'll come off as soon as uh, the we pandemic, have to The pandemic mustache. <laughs> yes, yes. I've noticed a lot of people uh, have uh, facial hair that... Uh, you know, uh, didn't have it before uh, because of uh, the pandemic. Nobody to cut the <laughs> right. Yeah, my wife cut my hair, so that's why I look like bald. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I, I cut my own hair like last week, and so it was a good thing I didn't slip and, <laughs> and take too much off. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. How is New York's recovery? New York is much better now, and uh, so this week we're starting up surgery, and next week I'm starting surgery myself, and uh, we are um, uh, doing uh, uh, office visits and so on. So, um, uh, yeah, great to hear that. Through. We 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 have uh, like a mirror. Uh, we we don't know what in Sao Paulo right now is a big mess. Uh, we don't know when we'll stop this, but we hope that as New York had that much of problem, as Europe had the problem, so we hope that in two or three weeks we may come back to a war. Yeah. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You look great. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions for Dr. Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would like to, to talk to you, Dr. Daniel. Uh, I think this, this question is, is a question from the majority of the surgeons here. And if Dr. Pimenta could uh, comment too, is when choose, uh, in, in a normal patient, in a young patient, when do you choose uh, total disc replacement or cervical flesh slash cage or standard alone cage? Yeah, so I uh, choose artificial disc replacement in a patient who has um, uh, no contraindications. So they don't have OPLL, they don't have instability, they don't have inflammatory disease like rheumatoid arthritis, they don't have tumors. And if they have a preserved disc height, it's mostly a herniated disc. Uh, it's not due to trauma or inflammatory or infectious pathology. Um, I get a plain x-rays, I get flexion extension views, I get a CT scan on everybody to make sure they don't have facet arthritis. And if mm -hmm. not, then I think they're an excellent candidate for artificial disc replacement. So that's, that's uh, for a young patient, I would say probably 90% of the patients are good candidates for artificial disc replacement in their 20s and 30s. By the time you're in your 40s, maybe about 40% or 50% are good candidates. By the time you're in your 50s and 60s, maybe about 25% become good candidates. And beyond 60, it, the, the numbers uh, drop precipitously. As far as um, uh, I use a fresh frozen allograft with an anterior plate, but people use standalone cages, people use... Uh, uh, cages with a plate, and uh, that's, I think, uh, surgeon preference. In my hands, what works best is fresh frozen allograft that I cut myself. I take an iliac crest allograft and I cut it. I usually put two or three pieces in to fill the entire disc space and an anterior plate with the longest possible screws, and I get great results with that, but people get great results with um, other types of constructs, and uh, so... Uh, um, uh, yeah, Dan, 
Yeah. Uh, can I can I criticize a little bit this? Um, not you. Yeah. By yourself, but the American surgeons in general. Yeah. Uh, we in South America, as in Europe, we use much more standalone cages, interfixated cages, yeah. because uh, as soon as you get stability which is the most important part of the, the fusion, uh, you don't need a, an interior plate unless you have instability, right? You, you probably agree with that. Uh, and when you add an interior plate, uh, you add another small problem. is If you don't place an interior plate perfectly well, not too close to the disc above or below, you may be causing uh, the next surgery. Uh, so I think that we do much more standalone ACDFs than uh, ACDFs uh, with plates here. Uh, mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but it's what I have seen here uh, in Brazil, at least, and in Europe. And I think this is related uh, maybe because of the coding uh, thing that happens, right? That in US you have a different coding for uh, adding a plate. Well, a standalone cage with a screw versus a plate and, uh, a, um, uh, and screws, it's about, I think, the same in terms of the, what the surgeon bills for it. Um, uh, so either one, uh, and, and there are a lot of people who use standalone cages in the U.S. also. The reason that I don't like them is that when I look at the fusion rates, um, I, I find that the fusion rates are lower. Now, other people have published that uh, for a single level, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But um, uh, if there really isn't a difference, if you do multiple levels, let's say you do a three or four level fusion, you see that there is a difference. And if there's a difference with three and four, it's probably because you, you, know, if the, the, uh, you don't have adequate power because if you only look at 30 versus 30, you won't see a difference. But if you look at 100 versus 100, I think you would notice a difference. Uh, but I, I would say that uh, I, there are a lot of people who do them here, they like them, and in their hands, it seems to work. Yeah, may I add a little bit of because uh, the question of uh, Marco uh, of uh, Bruno on on artificial discs, mm -hmm. um, and I was right in the beginning of artificial disc 2002. Uh, so uh, we in the beginning we thought that artificial disc will would replace uh, fusions, and we did artificial disc for for everybody, including the fully contraindications. Uh, then we start selecting better the indications. Uh, and still now, when I think in a patient, I always have to think, uh, if would me, do I want uh, artificial disc thinking that I may have uh, another surgery to fix it? Mm -hmm. When you do a fusion and it's fusing, at, mm -hmm. at least at this level, uh, we, we cannot do anything else or we shouldn't do anything else. I think that is, for me, a very important. I still do artificial disc in younger patients and younger is under 40 uh, mm -hmm. with a single beautiful disc or adjacent level to a fusion because adjacent level to a fusion makes a little more important uh, to keep the motion instead of having two or three level fusions. I like to have an adjacent level artificial disc uh, instead of another level of fusion. Mm -hmm. So is, 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 do you think is there, there is some, some, some kind of difference about the, the, the kind of, of uh, total disc replacement, uh, I mean, uh, metal, metal, or metal, polyurethane, or bone joint socket, How, what are the, your, your preference? I, I, I tend to use 
the disc that I'm using most commonly now is the Prestige LP. Um, but I think that uh, amongst uh, most of the artificial discs, when you, nobody's really compared, you know, one versus all of them to say which one is the best. And, uh, and uh, Luis uh, Pimenta has had uh, more experience uh, putting in more different kinds of artificial discs than just about anybody in the world. So I'm interested to hear what you say. Yeah, uh, then my experience in different artificial discs, and I, I probably uh, was exposed to five or six different, uh, and people would say, oh, elastomeric disc is better. Uh, and when you look at the two-year follow-up or five years follow-up, it's minor difference. Very difficult to believe that one is better than the other. One is good, is good, and doesn't matter what disc is. Yeah. One thing that we have to pay attention is that the surgery is different. Uh, artificial disc surgery requires better surgery than a simple fusion. So for younger, for younger surgeons, it's really important to understand that you do a fusion, yeah, you may leave a little bit of disc, uh, and you place your graft and, uh, uh, and, and you fix it and that's enough. But artificial disc requires good positioning of the prosthesis, well preparing of the end plates, you know, center of rotation. You have to think in different things. It's, it's different procedure. It's more it's more surgery, I would say. Yeah, it's much, much more difficult. Uh, I, I use the analogy that if you want to weld a door shut, um, you can teach somebody how to take soldering iron and a blowtorch and weld the door shut. The door could be crooked. The door could be too small, too big. It doesn't matter. You're just trying to leave the door so it never opens again, and anybody can do that. But if you are saying take the door off, put new hinges on, make sure the door fits perfectly and it closes exactly the same way. It takes much more skill, much more time, much more effort yeah. to get that door perfectly. And that's what you have to do with an artificial disc replacement. You have to take it out right. You have to position the patient right. You have to position the disc right. You have to do a thorough decompression. So it is much, much more difficult. Yeah, exactly. All right. É, vou abrir uma outra pergunta. Eu sou a Pris, você tem uma pergunta também, né? Eu também. Eu uma Pris. Dr. Felipe, você tem uma pergunta? Any questions for other doctors? Doctor, I have a question about uh, if you, do you have it, Doctor Dan, education for cervical surgery herniated disc with endoscopic technique. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. If you see education for foraminal herniated disc with endoscopic. Oh, for aminotomy with uh, endoscopic surgery? Yes. Yeah, so um, I do anterior for aminotomies um, to remove the underneath. <laughs> I do posterior for aminotomies. I do transcorporeal discectomies where I just drill a hole and take out the disc and plug the hole with bone. And, um, but I don't use the endoscope for any of those things. I use the microscope and... Um, I think it's fine to use the endoscope. There's nothing wrong with it. But in the anterior cervical spine, if you use an endoscope, you're making an incision that's maybe two centimeters. If you make a, uh, an incision, you can do it through three or four centimeters. And uh, through a transverse line, it's not going to make much of a difference. Posteriorly, you can do a tubular retractor, any kind of retractor, and do a two centimeter as opposed to one and a half centimeter uh, with a, a little tube and an endoscope. But the visualization is much better with the microscope. And uh, so my personal preference is just to do it open with a microscope. But there's, 
there are, I know some very excellent surgeons that I've seen operate with the endoscope. And in their hands, the endoscope works well. Uh, so I think the endoscope is an excellent uh, uh, way to do things. Uh, I just don't use them. Yeah, I can add a little bit of my own experience on endoscopes. Uh, and uh, the difference between an endoscope and a microscope uh, is that the endoscope is 2D and the microscope is 3D uh, or uh, open surgery is 3D. You, you have the distance, the depth distance uh, you don't have in the endoscope. Although it's very elegant, it's very minimal and I think that people trained in endoscopic uh, procedures do the procedure very well. I'm not against, I just, I, I'm not interested in learning or relearning endoscopic surgery, which I did a lot, but I, I'm not interested in doing things that I know that with a 3D I feel safe. I think a lot of people uh, that I know used to do endoscopic surgery in the U.S. Uh, have converted to doing uh, 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 microscopic surgery instead. And I think that's probably it, that uh, if you have just one complication with endoscopic surgery or you do an inadequate decompression, you realize that even if you're really good at it, you can miss something. And uh, so the majority of the people I know that used to teach endoscopic surgery have uh, stopped doing endoscopic surgery in the U.S. at least. Okay. Dr. Francisco Zanaga, question please. Hello, Dan. Hello, this is uh, Joao Pinheiro Franco. It's very nice to be here with you. And uh, as Dr. Pimenza said, with a new look here, <laughs> as my two daughters, they say that if medicine is not going in a well way this year, in the, in the end of December, I can work at Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my question to you and to all this great panel that is here is, for example, if you have one, you, you're going to operate two, uh, two discs, but you have a disc that you're going to operate, a normal disc, and then you had the second disc you have operated, but in the middle there is a normal disc. How, are, how do you analyze the variables to decide what you're going to do in this situation like this, if you have to operate these discs with a normal disc in the middle? So if I have, and that, that comes up all the time, so if one of those you can do an artificial disc replacement, then it's great. Because if you have C4, 5 and C6, 7 are problematic and 5, 6 is normal, and you can do an artificial disc at C4, 5 or C6, 7, it's just like doing a one level fusion. Uh, if you can do two artificial disc replacements, even better. If you can't, then you do one artificial disc at one level, you do a fusion at the other level. But if you have to do a fusion at 4, 5 and a fusion at C6, 7, if it's a young patient, I'll leave the five, six alone. But the older you are, the more I'm going to say, I think you're better off just having all three fused, the five, six prophylactically, because, you know, if you are 65 years old, the last thing you want to do is have the five, six end up being a problem and having surgery when you're 75. And studies show if you do four, five, five, six, six, seven, probably you'll never need surgery again. If you're 25, I would say just have the four, five, and six, seven done. Leave the five, six alone. If you have to do a fusion, because even if you do those three levels, the other two are going to break down. You might need surgery again when you're 50, and you're still going to be young then. And uh, so, just do the minimum numbers when you're young. If you're 95, just do two because you want to get the patient on the table and off before you kill them. Uh, but in the middle ages, you know, as you start to get older, I would say, just do it all. So it all depends on the age. What does the rest of the group think? Yeah, I, uh, if I can give my opinion, uh, I, I hate to, to do surgery in a normal disc. 
if I if I can, I would do only the the two. Doesn't matter if it's fusions or fusion. If I select fusion and artificial disk, usually I fuse the lower level and do artificial disk in the superior level. That makes more sense because of the movement of spike, of C spike. Uh, but uh, I, I would I would almost never do a, a a three level fusion when two levels when I have two level disease. And I understand if I my friend is plating. I, I would have to do the three levels, which is your case, Deb. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, that I do standalones, uh, I can do standalone four, five, and six, seven. And if the patient has a breakage, let's say five, 10 years after, which we never know, uh, I do another standalone in the middle. But who knows, right? I, I hate to do preventive surgery. Daniel, yes. I'd like to ask you one question. What would be the fusion between standalone and plate in the literature or your opinion about of the fusion? So if you take a look at a lot of the literature, that, and they will tell you for a one level, there is no difference between a standalone and uh, using a plate with uh, allograft and, uh, and so on. But if you take a look at how the fusion was assessed, um, that's where I have the problem because they look at uh, parameters like um, um, they looked at uh, flexion extension motion and if it was less than two millimeters, it was considered fused or something like that. That's not a very accurate, um, we published uh, results that said that if you're gonna use plain x-rays, you have to magnify the image at least 150% and you have to measure the interspinous distance and it has to be less than one millimeters. If you get a CT scan, you have to look for bone that's outside of the cage that you put in, uh, extra graft bridging bone, we said, and then it's very accurate at determining the fusion rate. So for a single level, there may not be that much of a difference um, and uh, uh, so for a single level, uh, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference, but as you do more and more levels, uh, the fusion rate gets lower and lower, no matter what you do, whether you use plates or allograft and whatnot. And, um, and uh, so I think it probably does make a difference when you're doing many levels, um, uh, but I, am, I would say that uh, what we should do is, um, um, we should do a comparison where uh, somebody outside of the surgeon, so uninvolved in the care of the patient, looks at the fusion rates at, uh, let's say, uh, six months, at three months, six months, and at one month to see how fast does it heal, number one, and what's the ultimate healing rate. Everybody used to say that the fusion rate for an ACDF is 100%. But when you look at the ACDF versus artificial disc replacement data in the United States for uh, artificial discs, those were assessed by radiologists, not by the surgeons themselves. And at six months, the fusion rate for a one level ACDF done by the best surgeons in the United States, because they chose the best surgeons to enroll in trials. For a one level ACDF, the fusion rate at six months was 60%. At one year, it was only 80%. At two years, it was only 90%. That's for a single level fusion. And before they did those trials, everybody used to say a single level ACDF, doesn't matter what you do, the fusion rate's 100%. And, uh, and what we found out through those prospective trials is that when somebody else looks at your surgery, <laughs> the results aren't as good as when you look at it yourself. And uh, so any comparison has to be done by somebody other than the surgeon. Hello, Professor Real. Good talk. Uh, if you have to perform arthrodesis or arthroplasty, 
uh, on two or three levels. Do you prefer to start from the bottom up or from the top down? Yeah, so I usually start uh, with the, the most um, uh, neurologic, the, the level with the greatest neurologic deficit. And um, so um, sometimes it's from bottom up, sometimes from top down. If it doesn't make any difference whatsoever, I prefer to go from top down actually. And um, uh, the reason is that uh, at C5-6, it's usually very easy to see on x-ray where everything is supposed to be. At C6-7, sometimes it's not as easy to see. And so if I can get the 5-6 perfect, so I put the cast bar pins in perfectly and I distract perfectly and I see where the disc is in the center and it lines up perfectly. I got a perfect artificial disc at 5-6. Now when I do the C6-7 level, all I have to do is see, okay, that's a straight line. I have to match it to be parallel with a straight line. This was in the center, so I have to put it dead center like here. And the second one is always easier to do than the first one. Um, and, uh, and another reason that the second one is easier is that uh, if the cast bar distractor pins are too close, then it's hard to get any of the things inside the disc. So you want to keep them as far apart as possible. So at C5-6, it, it's very close to the C6-7 disc and the C4-5 disc. And then when you go to the next level, you, you again have to be here and here. And it's hard to see that this one is not going into the C7T1. So I take the fluoroscope and I tell them to cone down so that I can just see the pin and where the next disc is so that the pins are perfect. But it's much easier doing that C6-7 level uh, if I've already got the 5-6 uh, done. But I've seen people do it the other way. And I think it's, uh, it's just whichever way you feel most comfortable with. Thanks, Dr. Bill. Bruno? That's all right. Okay. okay. Can I talk, uh, Marco? Luis Pinheiro? Can I ask? Can, Francisco, can I ask it for Daniel? Okay. Daniel, uh, do you think that the facetory arthrosis, not uh, uh, exuberant, not, not very, very high, but a little bit of the patients who are having a pain in the cervical. There is an indication in arthroplasty in this, uh, some uh, arthrosis in facet. So if the facet is really arthritic and it's causing symptoms, I don't, you, you can't do an artificial disc replacement because even if you take the disc out, the disc isn't the only problem. If you have facet arthrosis there, it's not going to help. Now, I know people that are taking care of patients who have facet arthrosis, but it's not symptomatic. And the way that they determine it's not symptomatic is they don't have pain there. It doesn't get worse when you extend the neck. They block it and the patient's pain doesn't get any better. And so they say that the uh, facet is uh, arthritic, but asymptomatic. So the problem is the herniated disc or spondylosis from the front. They take it out and they say they get great results with that. I have not done arthroplasties in patients with bad facet arthritis because I'm afraid that even if it's not symptomatic now, it may become symptomatic in the future. Uh, but again, if I've never tried it, I can't say it's a bad thing to do. Uh, I, I, I know people who I respect who say that they've done it in patients with facet arthritis that, uh, uh, and they've gotten reasonable results. So I, I don't do it. But, uh, but uh, as far as, is there good data that says you can do it? No, there isn't good data. Do you think uh, about of the myelopathy, or not myelopathy, but myel myomalacia? Uh, if there, uh, there is some myomalacia, without of the symptoms, do you, do, you do, you, uh, do you think that it's indications of the discompressions or about of this myomalacia, but without myelopathy. Yeah, so if you have somebody with myelomalacia and you still, you have some spinal cord compression, um, I believe that those patients are better having surgery. And uh, there isn't good literature on this. There's one paper that was written by Yasushi Oshima chief of spine at University of Tokyo. And what he did was uh, he uh, 
had patients that had very mild myelopathy. They might just had hyperreflexia or they might have had uh, minimal symptoms. And uh, he suggested that, uh, you know, that surgery might be an option, but these patients said, I don't want surgery. And there were about 40 patients that he followed. And, um, and long-term, he found that two of them uh, ended up quadriplegic with trivial trauma. And um, uh, so about four, 5% of patients who have myelomalacia with cord compression, uh, but or mostly asymptomatic, um, according to that one paper, uh, developed quadriplegia. One was a few years after he did the sur uh, he uh, did the study, uh, or he started following them. And another one was maybe about five years after he first saw the patient. Uh, so that's the only paper. And the problem with a paper being only one is you had two out of forty. If it had if it been three, it would have been you know seven eight percent. Uh, of the patients, uh, you would say, become quadriplegic. If it had been one, you would say it's only a two and a half percent risk of quadriplegia. And it's, uh, so it's not a good paper to base our opinion on. There is really no consensus opinion. Now, I was part of a group that got together in Toronto and Michael Failings was the lead in this group. And uh, what we said as a group consensus was that if you have myelomalacia and you have some cord compression, so there is some narrowing there, that based on that one study by Yasushi Oshima, that it is reasonable to tell the patient that you might consider surgery. It's also reasonable to say, let's just watch them and see what happens. Now, if the patient has just narrowing with no myelomalacia, we recommend doing nothing because Bednarik study and study that we've done shows that asymptomatic narrowing is nothing to worry about, that the vast majority of those patients do fine. Bednarik said, if you have narrowing and you have radiculopathy, EMG or SSCP that is positive, you should consider recommending surgery to them because they have a high incidence of going on to myelopathy. And we found that in our trials also. We just put in an abstract to the CSRS that said, if the canal space is narrower than seven millimeters, that there's about a 50% chance that that patient will go on to developing myelopathy and requiring surgery at some point in the future. But that still means 50% don't. And so I just tell those patients, these are the warning signs of myelopathy. And if you get them, then come back. Uh, and I also suggest getting an MRI every once in a while. And if they have myelomalacia, then operating. But again, that's a very controversial statement. And you will see many people disagree on whether that should be an indication for surgery or not. And uh, so there is no right answer based on the literature because there's only one paper that's been written on it uh, uh, that people rely on. Thank you so much. A wonderful explanation. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I have please two, two more questions. I have one question, if I could. Okay. Um, here's Fernando Marcelino from Sao Paulo. I stay with you for two months in 2018. And um, I was wondering, uh, I have done an alaminoplasty a few weeks ago. And um, I was thinking about, and I was discussing with my colleague, that I, I think I remembered you to uh, doing a flavectomy during, during the, the laminoplasty, or do you uh, let the, the yellow ligand alone and don't, don't move it? Don't. Yeah, so I do take the ligament and flavum out. Uh, so the most common laminoplasty I do is a laminectomy of C3 and then laminoplasty of four, five, and six. And so I do a flavectomy at two, three, and three, four, and at C7, T1. And then at um, uh, between four, five, and six, the ones that I lift up, I usually leave the ligament and flavum there alone because now I'm decompressing it by uh, extending the neck. And then before I uh, close, I hyperextend the neck to make sure that after I do the laminoplasty that it still moves. If I didn't do it right and the two lamina touched like this on extension, then I burrow away enough of it so even in maximal extension, they don't touch. 
And I make sure that uh, ideally, if you've done it right, they shingle just like uh, uh, you know, normal lamina at C6 will go over uh, C7 like that. But sometimes you lift this one too much and it, it hits. So you got to remove enough of the bone so that even in maximal extension, they don't touch. Uh, that's how you avoid hyperextension, uh, the, uh, the loss of extension motion that you get if you don't do that. Also, you got to irrigate out all the bone dust. Otherwise, you know, as you saw, you can get heterotopic ossification. So you saw me, you know, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate until all the bone dust is gone. Uh, and that also helps you uh, avoid infections. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you again. Yes. Dr. Bruno. Fasiloto, do you have a question? I have one question again, Marco. Please, Daniel, can you explain for me? I, I, I've heard you a lot of time uh, during the, uh, the lecture. And every time that you said that I, I do it uh, laminectomy in uh, C3, in mm -hmm. the other places, uh, I do it uh, laminoplasty. Every time that you are doing more laminoplasty than laminectomy, why you do it the laminectomy in LC3? Because of the ligament? Uh, no, no, it's because of what um, uh, Taguchi uh, from Japan published. And what he said is this, that if you do a laminoplasty of C3, then you lift up C3 and it tends to hit up against the large spinous process of C2. And, uh, and in order to lift it up and put a little plate there or whatever, you have to detach too much of the muscle attachment to C2, the semispinalis services. And so in order to avoid, um, and he found that if you do a laminoplasty of C3, you get limited motion because C2 hits C3 and you get more neck pain because the C2 hits up against C3. So he found that when you do a laminectomy of three, that you don't get any of that because now the spinous process of C2 can uh, move in extension without hitting anything. And, um, and I found that that's the case too. And it, it decreases the time because you don't, instead, laminectomy is so much faster than a laminoplasty. So the top level of every laminoplasty, I always just do a laminectomy. Because even if you're at C3 and you're doing a four, five, six laminoplasty, the four will hit C3. So I always do the top level as a laminectomy and then the next levels as laminoplasty. And I try not to do a laminoplasty of C7. And again, that's Taguchi and others that showed that if you do a laminoplasty of C7, then you're more likely to get neck pain. And the reason is this, the C7 is the vertebra prominent, so it's got a very tall spinous process. So if you do a laminoplasty and you cut off the spinous process, then you no longer have a tall place. The reason you have spinous processes is that the muscles go over the spinous processes and that gives you the lever arm so that when you pull on C2, you can pull it. If you take away the spinous process, the, osteo, the, the muscular ligamentous complex sags and the neck pitches forward and you get more kyphosis and your muscles can't pull on your neck as easily because they've been elongated because they're no longer like this. It's now very lax. So it tries to pull and it can't pull the neck. So the neck sags forward and you get a lot more neck pain. So that's what he published and uh, said that try not to do a C7 laminoplasty if you can. Now, sometimes you can't help it. You have to do it. Uh, um, and it just increases the risk. It doesn't mean that it's there 100% of the time. I always tell the patients if I have to do a C7 laminoplasty that there is a chance that you could get a lot of neck pain and kyphosis and I might have to do a fusion later on. Uh, so that's why I always do a laminectomy at the top level. I try not to do laminoplasties of C7 and, um, and uh, I always combine a laminectomy at the top level with a laminoplasty at the other levels. The next question, Dr. Bruno. Hi, Dr. Dan. I have one question regarding uh, hey. surgical facet syndrome. Do you have any strategy plan that you uh, worked out for your patients while, while you're uh, designating your level or your symptoms? Like, uh, I like what you did uh, designing your plan 
because I see a lot of patients with a pain over the scapula that arise from five, six, or six, seven, and they, they, they usually they don't uh, respect your dermatomes like the textbook. So, what's your average plan for your uh, cervical facet syndrome? So, the nice thing about uh, a facet syndrome is you can block it very easily. And uh, I don't do any blocks myself, but I send them to a pain management person and, uh, and, and they can block the C5-6. And, and if that takes away the pain, I tell them do a rhizotomy first. And then they do a radiofrequency ablation of uh, the, the medial branch. And if that gives them relief, I just say keep doing it until it stops working. If they've done it multiple times and the rhizotomy doesn't work anymore and the patient says, I can't stand the pain and I have confirmation that that facet is causing the pain, then a fusion at that level will take away that pain. And uh, now for, it's interesting that that facet syndrome doesn't seem to be as predictive uh, it's not as easy to diagnose which level is causing that facet syndrome as it is when you pinch the nerve. And it makes sense because a facet is innervated by the medial branch and, uh, and that medial branch may not necessarily also be irritating the, uh, the main nerve that's coming down to that area. So you may be getting mechanical pain in your neck that's causing muscle spasm as opposed to a pinched nerve causing muscle spasms uh, in a myotomal type of distribution. So, but the nice thing about a facet-based pain is that it's so easy to localize uh, by doing uh, facet blocks. Whereas in order to localize interscapular pain that's coming from, you have to do a, a nerve root block. And a nerve root block is much more dangerous to do. And our pain management doctors in the United States, they don't like doing nerve root blocks. I send patients for a nerve root block and they come back and they say, oh, they did a central epidural or they did a facet block because it was much safer. So there has been, there have been so many complications of the transforaminal or the nerve block that our pain management doctors just don't like doing it as much. Uh, but facet blocks, they love doing that. So it's easy to diagnose a facet based pain. I invite the doctor to close the meeting. I couldn't understand what you said. There was so much uh, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm Hear -hmm. me now? Yeah. I would like to talk about uh, when controversial surgery because we live in a, in a big cities with rare car accidents. So we receive many patients with quadriplegia uh, with uh, previous osteophytes. What do you think about the, the, the preventive surgeries with this, this kind of uh, narrowing canals with, uh, with risks? for the, the, the posterior quadriplegia. I'm, I'm sorry, so the trauma patients who, with uh, quadriplegia? Yeah, yeah. so this is one situation we see in big cities. Yeah. So concerning this, what do you think about uh, the, 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 the preventive surgery in that, that narrowing canals that, that uh, take the, the risk for the patients? Yeah, so um, if, for instance, you're, in the United States, the chances of a person becoming quadriplegic is pretty well known. It's one or two people out of 30,000 people become quadriplegic. And, uh, and there's a, a two a bimodal distribution. They're young males who get into accidents, who do stupid things. And then there's very elderly who fall in the bathroom and break their neck and become quadriplegic. So because the risk of uh, quadriplegia is only one to two out of 30,000, we can say that it's not due to uh, the risk, let's say, of cervical stenosis. Let's say that one person has no cervical stenosis and this, this person has cervical stenosis. This person's risk of being quadriplegic is one or two out of 30,000. This person's risk of becoming quadriplegic may be twice it may be two or four out of 30,000. But even if it's twice as much as this person is, the actual risk is still so low that we can say you don't need surgery because even if it's you know, twice what this person is, it's still very, very low. 
even if it were 10 times greater than this person's risk of surgery, I mean, risk of quadriplegia, if this is one to two out of 30,000 and this is 10 to 20 out of 30,000, that's one to two out of 3,000. Your risk of getting injured from surgery, the complication of surgery is much higher than one to two out of 3,000. And so it still doesn't make sense to do prophylactic surgery. But let's say in Sao Paulo that uh, your risk of quadriplegia in a, uh, you know, a 50 year old uh, patient is one in 500 because of the high accident rate. And you say, well, if it's one in 500 for a normal person, then in you, it's one out of 50. And if it's one out of 50, you know, I've done 6,000 cervical uh, spine operation and I have never had anybody become a quadriplegic. And uh, so I can say that in my hands, the risk of quadriplegia with surgery is less than one in 6,000. And so in my hands, if it's one in 50 chance of paralysis without surgery and one in 6,000 with surgery, then I would say you should have surgery because it's much, much better. So that's how you should think about should you operate for asymptomatic stenosis. I think that uh, if you see the asymptomatic stenosis and the risk is you know, much, much higher without surgery than with surgery in your hands, then you should do surgery. But if it's not, then uh, for instance, the risk of a, an average male dying of prostate cancer in a lifetime is something like one in 30. Something like one in 30 males will die of uh, prostate cancer. And if that's the case, should we take out every male's prostate at age 60 and make everyone impotent and, uh, and have incontinence of urine? Well, nobody would do that. The female's risk of developing breast cancer and dying in the United States is something like one in 30 also. So should we do prophylactic mastectomies on all females above the age of 35 uh, to prevent breast cancer causing death? We don't do that because it doesn't make sense. And, uh, and so if the risk of quadriplegia is you know, less than one in a 500 or something like that, you probably shouldn't operate because the risk of surgery may be one in 500. Uh, but, uh, but that's how I look at it when I try to decide, should I do prophylactic surgery? I look at the risk versus the benefit and what is the risk of the surgery causing a problem? All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dan, thank you so much. Excuse me for a long time of meeting, but as you know, you have a, a fun Daniel club in Brazil. <laughs> and good night for everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank Close. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Great to see bye all my bye. friends. Have a good night. Okay, bye bye.